For those of you that follow football, especially the local team, the Washington Redskins, you probably know that the quarterback for that team, Mr. Robert Griffin, had a pretty serious injury last weekend and will not be playing football for the next several weeks. At a press conference following the game, he got out to address the media. He was told by someone from the NFL or the team or the whoever, the league, you got to turn your t-shirt inside out. And the official excuse given was that the t-shirt was not manufactured by the official sponsor of press conference t-shirts, Nike. But the real reason was that he had a no Jesus, no peace slogan on his t-shirt. So they made him turn his t-shirt inside out or face a $10,000 fine for a personal message. And he talked about his injury, etc. And the story got out enough traction and it got around the world that he got his message out anyway. The world does not want you to know the things I'm going to tell you here this morning. The world doesn't want you to know about Jesus. The world wants you to think you are just fine, you're fine. And if you're just good enough and do enough things, everything will be happy and you'll be all right. It's not true. Without Jesus, you're not going to be all right. And you can have wealth and fame and money and position and title and do all kind of good things and have the respect of your friends and be the starting quarterback for your favorite football team. And if you don't know Jesus, you're not going to have any peace in your life. You are not going to find true contentment. You are not going to find wholeness in your soul unless you know the Savior. When Jesus came to earth, he came to reveal the person and the character and the nature of a God who is, of a God who loves, of a God who brings healing into our soul, who restores us, and he offers us life in himself. And if we reject Jesus, if we reject, reject the only means God has given for our salvation, how are we ever going to find Contentment. How are we ever going to find peace? Certainly not through God. John chapter 3, if you please. We meet a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a fascinating character. He was one of those sorts of people who, on the surface anyway, seemed to have it all going on in life. He was uh, wealthy, he's a powerful man, educated man. Pinnacle of human success. And yet, he comes to Jesus asking these important questions. And his money and his success did not lead him to the answers. Maybe there's someone here today that are struggling with these questions of worth and value and meaning and purpose in life. And I'm glad you're here. And I hope that some of the things I say in the next few minutes will be of value to you. You can have money and wealth and fame. And if you don't have Jesus, you're going to go try to find yourself and your purpose and your value out there in the eyes of your friends, in the opinions of others, through the achievement and accomplishment. It all crumbles. And only Jesus is enduring and everlasting. It's not about religion. It's not about this church or any other church. It's not about Baptists. It's not about anything except being restored to a relationship to our Creator. John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Would you stand, please, to honor the reading of God's Word? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? John answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Father God, enlighten us today. Give us your understanding and wisdom. Help us to see our need for you, Lord. And I pray you would be at work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. This man, Nicodemus, is an interesting fella. Verse 1 tells us quite a lot about him. He was a Pharisee, which means he was a well-educated man. We would suspect that he had the intelligence to go along with his education. We all know that it's not always the same thing. He was a ruler of the Jews, which indicates he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of elders in Jerusalem, a unique combination of political and religious authority. He was a Hebrew with a Greek name. That's an indication that he's from a progressive, upper-class, wealthy family. In short... Nicodemus was from the upper level of the upper class of Jerusalem of his time. And with all his success, he comes to Jesus with these deep and inquiring questions. Interesting that he comes by night. The author found it important to include that little tidbit into the story. And I don't want to read into what's not there, but we suspect that is given not only as an indicator of the time of day, but as a hint to Nicodemus' spiritual condition. Throughout scripture, light and life are connected. Darkness and death are connected as metaphors and parallels. And the fact that Nick comes at night probably indicates that he was far from God in his spiritual condition. Amazing, isn't it? A religious leader who was far from God. A religious spiritual authority figure who could talk the talk but didn't walk the walk. We've never heard of anything like that around here, have we? But with all that, I think Nicodemus was a sincere and honest kind of guy. He was truly looking for some answers and some wisdom from Jesus. He really wanted to know. And he goes to Jesus to inquire. And he shows Jesus respect and acknowledges his, his authority and his spiritual power. And I think we see that Nicodemus is a real guy with real questions. And he's looking for real answers to how to find grace and truth and peace with God. Because, you know... Inquiring minds want to know, right? Inquiring minds want to know. And we see that Nicodemus is that way. I meet a lot of people in ministry, talking a lot of places about Jesus. And all the people I meet, a lot of them do not agree with what I think about God and the Bible and salvation in Jesus Christ. A lot of them just say, I don't, nope, not for me. Now, for those who have rejected Christian faith out of ignorance, I don't have any words for you. If you've never read the Bible and you say, I don't believe anything in the Bible says, that doesn't make any sense. That's just your own animosity. That's your own frustration coming out, and we got nothing to talk about. For those who disagree after having had a healthy and serious and open-minded inquiry, who have been sincere in searching for some answers... And come to a different conclusion, well, you know what, we can still be friends. Because I respect your honesty, and I respect the openness. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So, I get it. And I was there once myself. And look where I am now. So I think Nicodemus is that kind of guy. An open-minded, open-hearted seeker. And he lays a few compliments at Jesus' feet, acknowledges him, shows him respect. And he says, I like what you're up to, Jesus, as a teacher, come from God. Well, Jesus was not a teacher come from God. Jesus is God who came to teach. Whole world of difference. Jesus comes as, as to teach us. To reveal the character and the heart and the nature of God. 
And he gets right to the heart of the discussion with Nicodemus in verse chapter 3. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I say to you, most assuredly, I say to you, amen and amen, I say to you. And we see that repeated throughout scripture. Every now and again, Jesus will say something like, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, or whatever your translation is, literally from the Hebrew, it's amen and amen, I'm telling you, listen up, because some really powerful truth is coming down, you got to know these things, and Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Must be born again. Verily, verily. Powerful words. Life-changing words. You must be made new with God. No matter where you started out from, no matter who you are, no matter your wealth, money, fame, your poverty, your sickness, your health, whatever it is, if you're living in the natural, you must be born again. You must get a do-over. You must get a restart with God. Because your life in the flesh that you are given by your parents is not going to cut it for the kingdom of God. Because all of us have this fundamental flaw in our soul. We're broken with sin. We're broken with sin. And we go our own way. And we do our own thing. And we are in a natural state of rebellion from our creator. We've said, never mind. We've said, no thank you. And it doesn't matter about our money or our religion or our good looks and charm. We're going to fall short. And there's no other way in the world, no other possibility to be right with God, to be a part of the kingdom of God, unless you are born again. That's good preaching, isn't it, Cheryl? Nobody says amen. Why is that? Think for a minute, imagine in your mind's eye the possibility, and this is not likely to happen for you, maybe it will. Suppose you get a phone call from one of those three-letter agencies to the east of here over by where all the tall white buildings are. And they say, we have a mission for you, we have an assignment for you, and we want you to be a world-class secret agent super spy, James Bond style, in the land of China. And out of your great patriotism, your love for America, and your thrill for adventure, you say, I will. And so you go to school and you learn to speak Chinese. And you learn all the Chinese customs and cultures. You act and dress and behave like a typical Chinese person would in the world today. You go so far as to have some cosmetic surgery to alter your appearance so you don't look so... Caucasian, European, but it maybe alter a little bit so you have a more oriental appearance in yourself. You go to Beijing with your fake passport, and you look so good that the customs agent says, Welcome home. And to every eye, you are the example of a modern American Chinese person. Would you really be Chinese? No. No. Because unless you are born of Chinese parents, you're never going to be of Chinese ethnicity, right? Unless you were born again in some way, and that, we just don't know how that would be possible. Well, spiritually speaking, it's the exact same thing. Because you, you can come to church, slick your hair, put on a necktie, or not, as I look around the, you know... Ladies, put on your makeup and a fancy dress. You can stand up at the right time, sing all the songs. You can put the money in the offering plate when it comes by. You can say, God bless you, brother, with the best of them. But unless you have been born again, you're only deceiving yourself. And you're not truly part of the family of God. The things you do on the outward appearance doesn't matter so much. What's in your heart? What's in your true heritage? God gives us the opportunity to be born again, born into a new family, born into a new standing with him and through him and by him. In verse 4, Nicodemus, like us, shows his confusion. 
And he thinks in terms of the earthly and the natural, and he wants to, how do I go back to my mother's womb and I don't get it? How does it work? How do I be born again? Well, that's the question. It's probably the most important question you will ever ask. How does one get born again? One of the reasons, Robert Griffin turned his t-shirt inside out, one of the reasons that our church is not chock full of the hundreds, the thousands of people in our community that need to know Jesus, one of the reasons that Christianity is rejected in the world today is because it claims an exclusive truth. The world wants us to be multicultural and, and, and inclusive and tolerance is the new favorite word. And the world wants you to think that every idea and every thought process and every notion and every religious expression is of equal merit and value and it's all the same. And that we should just... Everybody get a hug and get along. Now, I agree that there is wisdom and virtue in respecting cultures and ethnicities, and nobody should ever be judged based on the color of their skin or where they came for any of those kind of things. But i got to tell you one thing. This Christian faith is exclusive. And the claims of Jesus make it so. You must be born again by the Spirit of God or you're not going to be part of the kingdom of God. That's how that works. There's, there's one road that leads to God and the way is narrow and a few will find it. Jesus and Jesus alone is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except by him. And there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. It's an exclusive truth. And if you think differently, don't argue with me. I didn't write the stuff. It's what the Bible says. It's quite clear. Read it for yourself and see and understand. Verse 5, Jesus goes on to explain a little bit about what he means by born again. And like most of the Bible, there's a lot of room for discussion there's a lot of debate, and there's even some confusion. I think being born again, kind of hard to put into words, isn't it? How can you explain such a thing? Such a miraculous transformation of my mind and soul. There are not enough words in the world for me to explain what happened to me. It's mysterious. Oh, but I know it's there, and I know it's true. Powerful and it's life changing. Well, what's it like? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't even have words. It's spiritually discerned, it's spiritually enlightened, and unless the Holy Spirit of God awakens our understanding and illuminates our mind, there's not going to be a change of heart and there's not going to be a new kind of life. Verse 5 the Spirit, uh, Jesus talks about being born of water and being born of the Spirit. And even the theologians are disagreeing about what he says. Some people think that being born of water is talking about baptism. I disagree. I don't think so. That would include a, uh, a, an obedience works type thing in your salvation. Some people are talking about uh, since our bodies are composed of 70% water, that being born of water means you know, our natural life, life in the flesh. But that doesn't make any sense to me because... If we'd never been physically born, we'd never need to be spiritually reborn, so I don't get that either. Ephesians chapter 5 gives a reference to the washing of water by the word. It seems likely to me that Jesus is using water as a meta, uh, metaphor for the spiritual cleansing power of the word of God. It's the word of God that purifies us. It's the word of God that convicts us of our need. It's the word of God that cleanses our heart. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we must be born of water and we must be born of the spirit. I think Jesus is saying we must have the, the word of God washing over us. We must have the spirit of God drawing us and enlightening us. And we must of our own free will say yes to God and choose after him and receive him as Savior and follow him as Lord. 
a combination of things working together that draws us to a new place with God. That draws us to a new point of understanding what all this is about. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Because you must be born again. In the natural, in the self-directed, self-interested, self-involved life that we are born into, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And we can't earn it. And we can't work our way toward God. And all of our fame and all of our money, all of our accomplishment, none of that's going to give us any peace in God's kingdom. And you and I are nowhere near good enough. We just don't measure up. That's the way it is. It's a great mystery. Go on down to verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. No doubt Nicodemus was an Old Testament scholar. And he understood the stories. It's a reference here to the story of Numbers chapter 21. The children of Israel are wandering the desert. Uh, Moses is leading them. The Israelites are complaining and grumbling and whining and moaning. I wish I could go back to Egypt. So God sent them some poisonous snakes among them. Give them something to really cry about. You know what I mean? So they were dealing with the poisonous snakes and they were getting sick and some were dying. And then... Uh, God spoke to Moses, make a bronze serpent, hoist it up on a pole. And when the people look at the serpent in faith, trusting in the power of God, they will be healed. They will be saved. In the same way, we look upon Jesus hoisted up upon a pole in faith, believing in the power of God, we will be healed. We will be saved. We will be born again. Acts chapter 16, in the middle of the night in the Philippian jail and the walls were shaken and everybody was in fear, the jailer says to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 